Welcome back to History of Mathematics. We are continuing our work through Chapter 10 of our textbook here, Makers of Mathematics by Stuart Hollandale. We are going to talk about Isaac Barrow. So Isaac Barrow was important for a handful of reasons, one of which was he was Isaac Newton's teacher, um, not quite in the sense that we would understand, uh, you know, nowadays, but um, that, that basically sums it up. And in his time at Cambridge, he published a collection of lectures which had a, uh, a very important theorem that he got some help with from Isaac Newton. So we'll get into that right now. And I'm going to switch over to the document camera. Okay, so some notes about Isaac Barrow. As I mentioned, uh, his relationship with Newton was basically his teacher. And his lectures on geometry contain a proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So most of the time when we use the fundamental theorem of calculus, we use this part right here, which, depending on your hypotheses, could actually be a corollary to this part. But this first part says that if we define a function to be a definite integral, of another function, then the derivative of the integral is the integrand. In other words, this is saying that differentiation and integration are inverse processes of each other. Okay, so in Isaac Barrow's collection of lectures on geometry, he has this theorem relating differentiation to integration. And in a preface to several examples of using this theorem, he mentions that he got some help from a quote-unquote friend, and that friend actually happens to be Isaac Newton. So, the second fundamental theorem of calculus is the one that we use most often when we're evaluating a definite integral, and basically that says you can evaluate this definite integral by constructing an antiderivative, and then evaluating the antiderivative at the endpoints. Okay, of course, such a function, capital S, has to exist for us to be able to do that, but a very handy idea right there. So every student of mathematics should at least understand the gist of this fundamental theorem of calculus. So let's take a look at that. <laughs> Okay, so we are going to define a function a of x, and that will be the definite integral of another function f from 0 to x. Okay, so this is a perfectly good way to define a function. If we are given the function f, we simply take our input value x, put it as the upper limit on our integral, and we find the value of that definite integral, and that's the output for the function a. And we're just using a for area. Okay, so uh, right here you can see an illustration of this. If that is the value t equals x, this region right here represents a of x, so the area under the curve from 0 to x. And if these are two different t values, t equals x and t equals x plus h, then this little strip represents a of x plus h minus a of x. If I just looked at a of x plus h by itself, it would be the area from t equals 0 all the way over to here. But remember, I just want this little strip, so I'm going to subtract this away. Okay, so that's the geometric interpretation of what this function a 
is telling us. So, to understand the gist of the fundamental theorem of calculus, what we want to do is look at this quantity right here. Okay, we want to consider what we can do with a of x plus h minus a of x over h. And the idea is that if h is small, then this difference can be approximated by f of x times h. Okay, so in other words, if h is really tiny, this strip would be really narrow, so the two sides wouldn't be too much different in height. Okay, instead of having a big difference like you see here, if I were to do something like this, so h is really tiny, you see, okay, these two are pretty close together. Right there. Okay. So, when h is small, this difference can be approximated by this. So, in particular, if we were to look at the limit as h goes to zero, that means we're concerned about what happens when h gets small. We can approximate the numerator by this and cancel out the h's and get f of x. So, in other words, the derivative of my area function a is equal to the function f of x. And uh, there was, of course, an assumption built into all that. And the assumption is that f of t behaves nicely when h is small. So in other words, the function isn't wiggling around wildly in a tiny interval so that this up here wouldn't be true. If you were to take a course in real analysis or some places it's called advanced calculus, you might talk about various conditions you can put on f to make this more precise rather than just saying it behaves nicely. But to understand the gist of the fundamental theorem, we only need to have that little picture in our heads. So the derivative of the integral is the integrand. So a very useful fact. And that was something that was proved in Isaac Barrow's collection of lectures on geometry, and partially with the help of, of Isaac Newton. So a uh, very important result here. We do have one more thing to talk about with Isaac Barrow. And uh, we'll put a link to that uh, right, over, right over here, I think. And that would be about his work on construction of tangents and how that led to our modern method of finding arc length.